we are in the third church of the seven. So in Revelation chapter 2, I present to you a message of Ephesus, and then Ben did Smyrna. And it's easy to remember because it's associated with myrrh. And that was the persecuted church to which Jesus said, I was dead, but I'm alive. For the church that was facing tortures and persecution, that was much needed reminder. And so today we're looking at a message to a very interesting church, Church of Pergamum. Um, there's a lot of stories I could tell you about Pergamum, but we're not focusing so much on the city or the setting, more on the message. Uh, the city is still standing. It's interesting that Arabs, they switch between letters B and P. So pizza become pizza, and Papa becomes Baba. And so Pergamon becomes Bergamot. So that's the city in Turkey. Uh, beautiful ruins. Um, I hope that our conference could organize a trip for pastors and families to go to Turkey, seven churches of Revelation. That would be added value to our spouses especially. These are just few pictures from the ruins uh, near Bergamot. The city is on a hill, which is a very interesting location, but there's also a valley. It's a large city comparatively today in Turkey. But this is a significant detail. Um, you may guess what this is. Do you see what's in the picture? How would you call these things? No. There's a word for that. Amphitheater. You see? And so what does it tell you? place of gathering, but it's also a large city, because they would build this huge, humongous amphitheater where they would perform a drama, where they would perform plays, and people would come and sit on that hill, and so that's a sign that this was a large city. In fact, that was the capital city of Pergamum Empire. For about three centuries, it was a capital city of an empire that was there in Turkey. Now, this is the ruins of uh, one of the temples, and as any pagan city, it hosted many temples, right? Of significance is what you see at the bottom of these columns. You see, the columns are still standing, but it's when you start looking at the bottom, you see carvings in a stone of something that is a creature that snake. So you recognize snake. In Pergamum, they really adore snakes. They see snakes everywhere. It was a part of their culture, all right? And so in their emblems, and their logos, there are snakes. In their coins, there are snakes. I'm just putting this because notice we would read there that I know where you live. You live where Satan lived. Okay. I'm just building the picture right now so you would think of Pergamon before we read the passage. They had a special honor to this fella. Again, do you see the snake around his staff? His name was Asclepius. Uh, we know him as Esculap. Does name ring a bell to anyone? Anyone who studied medicine would know that he is the same symbol of medicine, medical science. In their legend, he had five daughters. Do you see their names? Panacea. Do we still use that word in English? A remedy for all illnesses, we call it what? Panacea. The second daughter was hygiene. Have you heard of hygiene? The goddess of cleanliness, goddess of sanitation. So on one side, you could say, this is great. They had this god and goddesses that dealt with health. Now, I'm not going to go way off subject today, but you probably heard such expression as health deform. Not health reform, but health deform, where our commitment to health could become so extreme that it's more damaging than helpful, you see. And so they actually had the whole setup for medicine. 
Today's medical symbols are borrowed from Asclepius and Pergamon. Now, whenever you see ambulance or pharmacy, you probably recognize the symbol, right? That is the symbol of Pergamon, is the symbol of Esculap. The, now I say it satirically, you know, the saint of pharmaceuticals, okay? But it was the ancient god of Pergamon. This is another coinage, gold coin, with inscription of Esculapius. And again, you see the snake on the altar. So we're not going to dive into more details, but you could imagine how messed up the culture was there. They're finding some underground tunnels that lead to certain rooms that the only thing they could suspect were medical laboratories, labs. What was happening in them? No clue. Leaves a lot to our imagination. But friends, when we think sometimes of the ancients as being backwards and, you know, not skilled enough, wake up. They're finding out Scythian mounds in southern Ukraine, and Scythians were interacting with these folks. And they're finding that back then, 2,500 years ago, they already knew how to drill teeth and do the dental work and do gold fillings in your teeth. They were so skilled with dentistry. So we don't know what was going on there. Now, a city that has been lost to history and no one really knows where it is. There's a lot of speculation. Um, it's a legendary city that used to fight with Sparta in Greek history. Any of you guess what city I'm talking about? You've heard of Troy? You've heard of Trojan horse? The city was burned and destroyed. The city was very close to what we know as Bergamot or Pergamon. So there's a close connection there too. Why am I talking about this? Because we live in an interesting time when medicine is reaching new horizons, when the stuff happening in medicine is very promising. Who don't want to live long? Who don't want to be cloned? Who don't want to have genes altered that you would be healthier? And yet, it's in this setting to the Church of Pergamon, notice how Jesus begins the presentation. These things, says he, who has the sharp two-edged sword. In a city that was advanced in their medical industry, city that was well known to surrounding countries, that if you need healing, if you need medical treatment, you come here and we have potions for you, panacea. And we have special water bath treatments for your hygiene and other things. They created pursuit of longevity and medicine, their God. And so Jesus speaks to Pergamum saying, I'm the one who has the two-edged sword. Now, do you know what that represents? The two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus. What is the sword symbol of? We just studied recently the spiritual warfare. The word of God, that's right. And so Jesus is coming and pointing out that my word is important. I'm coming to you with my word. And friends, today again, when we're facing all kind of issues that call for medical ethics, let's turn to the word of God. Let's make sure that we seek counsel and wisdom in the Word of God, not in some latest fads or promises. It may be even homeopathic medicine, but let's make sure that we stick with the Word of God. Let's look at the message further. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Now, I emphasize that, put in three lines, because in verse 13, three times, there's this play on words. You see, I know where you're settled down, where the throne of Satan is, where Satan has settled down. Now, we're going to discuss things later, but think of this. You settled down where? where Satan settled down. 
Commentators are debating this because there's no clear-cut answer. They're not quite sure what does it mean Satan dwells there. Is this reference to their medicine and medical experiments and Asclepius and all the serpents that they used even in their medicine? Or is this reference to something else? Further archaeological digs reveal some other interesting structures. They had a special throne of Zeus. Okay? So some suggest maybe this throne of Satan refers to the throne of Zeus that was worshipped in that city. And I tell you, it was an impressive structure. This is a reconstruction that right now is in Berlin, in Germany. And when they see how they've built it, and when they do the mapping of all the structures, it's right there at the bottom, at the center. Do you see it's next to the amphitheater? Okay. Next to other major temples. So it seems that their whole worship was around Zeus. And if you know anything about Greek philosophy, Zeus was the main god. He was their main idol. And it's bold that Jesus calls him Satan. We say it time and again that if you really study the Bible, God communicates to us. The gods of other nations are what? Demons. Now, this could be a whole another hour of conversation. That's why I'm not comfortable when they tell me it's okay to use Diwali to connect with my Indian neighbors. You get my point? I'm ethnic Ukrainian, and I know my culture, and we have some weird festivals. For instance, we have a festival of Ivana Kupala, and that's a festival when they set big fires on the riverbank, and the girls dance around the fire, and they braid these beautiful um, you know, crowns on their heads, and then they let them go on the water. And the boys run and jump over the fire and the water. And they're supposed to swim and catch one of these. And so once you catch that, that's a sign from God that she's yours, even if it's for the night. Now, should Christians participate in that? Hello? And this is where we have to be careful that we do not make our culture an excuse for why we're engaging in certain ethnic activities. Because if you pay attention to this message, Jesus says, I know where you live. You're in Pergamum, and you have certain gods, but in my perspective, those gods are nothing but Satan. You live where Satan lives. Don't settle down where Satan has settled down. I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to touch Kirubana Festival or anything else, okay? But let's be careful that our culture does not take priority over Jesus. With that also comes in verse 13 a beautiful encouragement you are grasping firm my name that holding in greek it's the word kratos krateo from which we have words as democracy right to hold okay and you did not deny my faith i find it interesting because as we talk about churches ephesus was apostolic church smyrna was persecuted church second and third century this is the compromising church. Pergamum is the church that is going downhill after Constantine has made Christianity a state religion. He gave them the pagan temples. So imagine in Pergamum, the Christians of Pergamum would be given keys to the temple of Esculap. They would be given keys to those pagan temples and told, now this is your church. Come and worship here. Now, Again, when you read the Old Testament Tanakh, the instruction through Moses were, do not ever go to those places to worship. Okay? Destroy them, bring them down. Christians did compromise. But what's interesting, during the same era, in spite of their compromise, the theology that emerged in these two centuries is actually solid theology. Tell me if I'm wrong here. Council of Nicaea affirms that Jesus is truly God. Is this something we still hold true? Yeah? We're Nicaean because Council of Nicaea affirmed that Jesus is truly God. And this is where they fought Arius, Arianism, 
who said, no, he was not really God, he was man who was adopted in divine family. But Council Nosia says Jesus is truly God. The next significant council is Council of Constantinople that says, yeah, Jesus was God, but he was also truly man. And him was both divine and human, 100%. How we don't know, it's a mystery, but divinity and humanity were together in him. The next big, big council is Council of Ephesus 431 that affirms this, that divinity and humanity was combined in one person. Not two persons, one person. Do you see that the theology to which we're still holding has emerged there? And so the message is, you're holding to the faith, and that's good on you. And then finally, this Council of Chalcedon, that both natures are distinct in Jesus as a person. So it's not some kind of merger. We don't understand the mystery, but he was fully divine, fully human, yet one person. Okay? Now, the councils that would come after when we study Thyatira, that's where problems begin. Now, as we keep reading, I have a few things against you because you have their those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block. Therefore, the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So we pause here. It's interesting that Nicolaitans were mentioned before in Smyrna, right? But here, before he's mentioning Nicolaitans, he's mentioning who? Balaam. And so there's this connection between Balaam and Nicholas. Now, there's a lot of speculations of who the Nicholas was. Some suggest he was the deacon, one of those seven, remember, selected in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. One of them was Nicholas, all right? But there's no evidence in church literature about it until you come to this guy, 7th century Spanish Gothic bishop Isidore of Seville. And so he writes a book which is called The Church and the Sects, where he writes the first known history of official Christian church and all the splinter groups that exist. And among the sects, he lists the sect of Nicolaitans. And he comes with the weirdest idea. I don't know. I, I have a hard time believing that that's possible in the first century. But according to this legend, this deacon from Jerusalem, Nicholas, had such a beautiful wife that he felt guilty for possessing such a beauty. So he decided in his heart that such a beauty should belong to all. Now, do you realize how messed up that is? Suggesting that he was the first swinger. And so he basically offered his wife to all the men in the church. Now, that just messed up. But see, the theories come why? Because you read about eating forbidden food and idolatry. Now, in history, Balaam did that. Remember his suggestion to uh, the kings that tried to trick Israel? He says, bring some of your women to the camp and let them mess with their men. And you would do more damage. That was suggestion of Balaam. But friends, remember that this is symbolic. I believe that we're not talking about some literal heresies. By the way, it says where Antipas was killed. No historian knows who Antipas was. And so when you look at this from symbolic perspective, we're not sure what it could mean. I mentioned to you before, and I keep repeating, that the words Nikolaos in Greek and Balaam in Hebrew have a similar meaning. Both means lording over people, conquering the people, devouring people. You see this concept? And what's of interest that it's at that time that a new theology emerged. As they took over those pagan churches, they also start building their own churches. This is one of the earliest Christian churches that's still in existence that came from about the same uh, territory. That's how they start building the churches. So this church is about 1,600 years old. 
Now, why is this significant? Because it's at that time that an attitude emerged that clergy is above the laity. If you're clergy, if you're priest, you're above the people. And people should simply show up, shut up, and pay up. Now, we have to be careful because Jesus says, I hate that. That thing of lording over people, I hate that. And so, friends, I don't know about you, but I also hate whenever people start talking about hierarchy. Makes me a bit upset, okay? Even if we compare it in a good way, saying, you know, there's a committee and there's one leader and there's teams, be careful that we do not project the hierarchy, all right? People are not to kiss pastor's feet. Parishioners are not to kiss Pope's ring or his foot or statue of Peter feet. Now, you come from a certain part in Africa. Uh, if you were from West Africa, I would use that as an example. There are pastors who literally are so holy that they can't touch the ground. They have to walk on the backs of people. I mean, you watch those pictures, it's, it's crazy, it's messed up. One of those pastors, Sunday Adelaja, came to Ukraine and established the largest church in Ukraine. You know what he was known for? When he sitted on his pew before he goes on the stage, the deacons would have to kneel on all four, provide their box, that he would step on their box to get on the stage, okay? The abuses that that guy caused is just crazy. The government of Ukraine actually had to try to put him in jail for running Ponzi scheme and so other things. But friends, I believe that problem of Church of Pergamum was leaders, pastors, lording over people. Development of church hierarchy. That's when the Catholic Church started developing the attitude of, I'm above everybody. That's why when we start with Thyatira, we enter that period when the Pope declares himself above all the bishops in all the Christian world. Remember how Peter writes, and there's a beautiful passage in 1 Peter 5, where he calls us under shepherds, and Jesus is the main shepherd. And so this is where warning to Ben and myself, Ben, you're not really the shepherd, okay? This is not your flock. This flock belongs to Jesus. Myself, we're just under shepherds. And that's where Apostle Paul says, Jesus is the groom. You are just the best man watching the bride for the groom, okay? Now, let me come to the end of this passage, and we'll pray more. I said something before. Or watch this. For every church, there will be increase in rewards. The first church has promised how many rewards? One. The second church had two rewards. This is the third church. Watch it. It's going to be three rewards. Look at this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. What is the first reward? Hidden manna. Now, I wish I would understand more what it means. I look at many commentaries. Scholars are still puzzled. What does it mean? Now, you know that in the most holy place, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was what? Manna. And that manna was what? Hidden. It was there. I don't know how it could stay fresh, but apparently it was there in the ark, in a bowl, and it was a hidden manna. Now Jesus, in John chapter 6, says that I am Jesus Christ. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. Jesus equates himself with that manna. So Jesus is offering himself, says, when you overcome, you'll get to taste me. You understand the symbolism here. Let's look at the second reward. And I will give him a white stone. And that's a beautiful thing because the second reward to the church is this white stone of acquittal. You've probably heard the stories before that in ancient times, the way judge would determine that someone is innocent, he would give them a white stone. The black stone meant condemnation. The white stone may acquittal and so he's referring to this tradition that they knew in pergamum when you receive a white stone on trial you're acquitted 
We just study with you judgment. The judgment belongs to who? To the saints. We will be acquitted. That's the promise. But again, it's conditional. To him who overcomes, I'll give a white stone. You want a white stone? Overcome. Overcome sin in your life. Overcome temptations. Overcome Satan that dwells maybe in your neighborhood. And now comes the third reward. Remember the third church? Three rewards. And on the stone is a new name written. And I find that beautiful. Because name means identity. New name is new identity. As much as you love yourself, I have a news for you. Jesus wants you better than you are. And he will give you a new name. As much as Jacob may have been proud of being Jacob, Jesus says, no, no, from now on you would be called Israel. As much as Abram was okay with being Abram, Jesus says, you're going to be Abraham. Now, I don't know what new name Jesus has for me. I kind of like being Alex. Okay. But Jesus has a new name for me. We're saying there's a new name written in glory. I'm looking forward to that. When Jesus comes, we all would have a new names. Jesus alone knows your true nature, true name. And when he comes, he'll reveal that to you and you would live up to even higher character than you develop here. And so it's important for us to remember that, yeah, with all the danger of Nicolaitans and Balaam and living in Pergamum and throne of Satan being in the neighborhood, there is that option of overcoming with Jesus to receive the new name. And so, friends, as we continue at these love letters of Jesus to his churches, these are not just messages of warning. I call them love letters of Jesus. Reflect of what they mean to you today personally. 